trust in. Now, who does the money belong to? John? No, the money belongs to my children, the beneficiaries of the trust. Do they have to do anything to get that money? Well, no, probably not. Just grow up. You know, if I've got a son that's a real bum, maybe I'll say that he's got to get married before he gets the money. But I can write that into the contract. And so if my son turns 21 and he's not married, can John give my son the money? No, that would be a breach of contract. John has a fiduciary responsibility to execute that contract as I, as I wrote it. The Constitution is a political trust. Who wrote the trust? The Founding Fathers. What did they want to give us? Money? No. Liberty and security. They fought for it, they had it, and they wanted to make sure they transfer it to their posterity. So what did they do? They wrote up a trust, a contract, with a group of people who are the trustees. Who are the trustees of this contract? Government. Anybody who goes into office. Why do they take an oath of office to solemnly swear to uphold and defend the Constitution? So that if they violate that contract, they are guilty of perjury and treason. Perjury is punishable by imprisonment. Treason is punishable by life in prison or death. This is not small potatoes. This is serious stuff. So the Constitution is a political trust, and everybody who goes into office takes an oath of office, and they have a fiduciary responsibility to protect your rights. It's not just a good idea. It's a contractual obligation. So we want to put limits on that power. Now, one of the things that the Founding Fathers did was to establish a system of checks and balances. How many people remember that? Good. Now, what are the system of checks and balances? Lock and key? Well, it's kind of, sort of. There were three branches of government. You had the legislative branch that makes the law, the executive branch that enforces the law, and the judicial branch that uh, adjudicates breaches of the law. But it's all law. And we want to make sure that each group doesn't have too much power. So we separate them. <coughs> Ironically, the first three articles of the Constitution are legislative, executive, and judicial. You want to know anything about Congress, go to Article 1. You want to know anything about the President and Vice President, go to Article 2. Supreme Court, that's Article 3. Let's talk about Article 1, which is legislative. Um, go, to, I should, go to page 17. It says, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress consisting of a Senate and House of Representatives. Why do we have a Senate and a House of Representatives? Why didn't we just have, like, one big room? That would, you know, if you're going to argue, at least you're there in the same room together. There was a fight between the states. The little ones felt like they wouldn't be representatives, so if they got two senators, they would be equal. But representatives... Kind of Good. So we're, we're trying to argue about this Constitution. And you've got big states like New York and Virginia and lots and lots of people. You've also got little tiny states like New Jersey and um, Rhode Island. And they're saying, well, okay, we're going to vote. The big states are saying, we're going to vote by population. The more people you get, the more votes you get. The small states are going, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not fair. You guys have got way more people than we do, so if we decide to do that, then we're never going to get a vote, or we're only going to get so many votes it's not going to count. You know, we're never going to have any say-so. So each state should have its own vote. One state, one vote. And the big states are going, whoa, 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 that's not fair. You guys have only got 
you know, 20 people. So if you guys vote, then everybody in Virginia is supposed to go the way that uh, in Virginia or New Jersey goes? That doesn't sound fair. This was the biggest argument in the entire thing, is how they were going to vote. It ended up being the great compromise. You're not going to do it that way. We're not going to do it this way. We're going to do it both ways. The House of Representatives currently has 435 members. The number of representatives that you have depends on how many people you have. That makes the big states happy. The Senate was originally going to have one. They decided to have two just in case somebody got sick. Every state gets two senators. That way, whether you're New Jersey or Texas, you still get two. Everybody's got the same vote. So you make the small states happy, and you do it both ways. Now, we can go through. What I'd like you to do is uh, go to page 18, and we're going to look at uh, section 2, clause uh, 3, which says, uh, shall be determined by adding the uh, whole number of persons. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of Congress and within every subsequent term of ten years. What are we talking about? The census. Why do they take the census? They have to. It's in the Constitution. Why do they take a census? Why do we go out and count noses? For representatives. To find out how many representatives you've got. What happened to Texas in the last census? We added two representatives. That's because Texas is so wonderful, everybody's moving here. You go, wow, you guys got a lot more people. We're going to have to give you two more representatives. What does that mean about somebody else? They lost two somewhere along the line. So the census is mandatory. They have to count and find out how many people. Can they ask you how much money you make, whether you're living with somebody, how many children you have? No. Well, they can, but you don't have to answer. <laughs> oh, that's good. Good response. They can ask, you know, but they don't, you don't have to tell them. I got, unfortunately, the small form. I was, I was hoping to get the big form, so there would be more answers that I refused to answer. More, more questions that I refused to answer. But they're supposed to take the census for representatives and taxation. Direct taxes are supposed to be apportioned to the several states. Direct taxes are uh, taxes that you cannot avoid. Indirect taxes are taxes that you can't avoid, like a sales tax. They got a tax on gasoline, and you don't want to pay the tax, what do you do? Don't buy gas. Don't buy gas. But if it's a direct tax, you can't avoid it. They basically come and collect it. Well, a direct tax cannot go directly to the people. It is apportioned to the several states. Congress has to write a bill, say, well, we need a million dollars for whatever. Now, if they need a million dollars, Washington, D.C. should send a bill to Sacramento, California for their share. Sac uh, California has 10% of the people in the United States. One out of every 10 people in the United States lives in California. So, Washington, D.C. should send Sacramento a bill for $100,000, or 10% of the bill. If Sacramento's got the money, they should write a check, and the people of California never know. If they don't, well, then they can send out a, a you know, tax everybody 25 percent or 25 cents for your fair share. But once that tax is collected, it's over. End of story. Now, please go to page 20, and we want to look at Article One, Section Four. Dash two. The sections are labeled in your book. The clauses are not. So when you get to a clause, you just have to count paragraphs. So this is the 